Good afternoon and welcome. Did you know that two in five Canadians are expected to be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime? One in four will die from the disease and 90% of those deaths are caused by the spread of cancer. Cancer research plays a vital role in helping to change those odds and London, Ontario is home to the first team of its kind in Canada looking to better understand and stop the spread of cancer. My name is Pam Taylor and I am the Director of Development at London Health Sciences Foundation. Together with my colleagues and our distinguished lineup of presenters, we would like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. A few things about today's tour. First, everybody's sound is currently muted. And if at any time today during these presentations you have a question, please feel free to write it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer all of them live at the conclusion of the tour. We'd like to begin today by introducing Dr. David Palma and Dr. Allison Allen, who are co-leads of our Translational Cancer Metastasis Research Program. Dr. David Palma, MD, PhD, is a professor and radiation oncologist at Western University. He holds an MD from the University of Western Ontario, a master's degree in epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health, and a PhD from the VU University in Amsterdam. He has led several international randomized trials in radiation oncology, and he is also the author of the best-selling book, Taking Charge of Cancer, What You Need to Know to Get the Best Treatment. Dr. Allison Allen is a senior oncology scientist, co-lead of the Metastasis Translational Research Team, and director of the Translational Breast Cancer Research Unit within the London Regional Cancer Program at London Health Sciences Center. She is also the chair of anatomy and cell biology and a professor of oncology and anatomy and cell biology at Western University. Dr. Allen's research program is focused on the investigation of cellular and molecular mechanisms of cancer metastasis, in particular, the study of circulating tumor cells, cancer stem cells, and the metastatic microenvironment, and how this knowledge can be used to benefit patients in the clinic. Dr. Palma and Dr. Allen will be doing an overview of our translational metastasis research program. Thanks, Pam, for the introduction, and thanks everybody for joining us remotely. Uh, we would really love to have you come in and walk around and show you the place. Uh, but the good thing is we couldn't fit all 62 of us in my office at this time. <laughs> so even if restrictions were, debt were, were gone, we couldn't have us all here at once. But hopefully we'll be able to uh, enthuse you a bit with the research that we're doing. And then next time when we can do it in person, you will come and we'll do this all over here with some coffee. We're going to talk today about stopping the spread of cancer. I'm a radiation oncologist, meaning that I'm a doctor who treats cancer using radiation. And I just want to start with a story about a patient of mine to show you how cancer causes problems. Why is cancer the leading cause of death in most countries, sadly? This is a patient that I met many years ago. This is their scan. And this scan is a CT scan that's showing a lung cancer. The scan shows the patient lying on their back on the table here. And uh, this, these are their bones the arm bones, and these are the shoulder blades, and these are the lungs. And lungs on a scan are, this, they're filled with air, so they're black. Uh, air on a scan is always black, like the air in the room here. So you can see that there is this white tufty thing in uh, the patient's lung. This is actually their right lung. You can see a little R there. This is a little tufty thing that is actually a, a cancer. And normally, this would be a very curable cancer if that's the only spot of cancer that there was. This is a cancer that could be easily cured with either surgery or a very precise form of radiation. But when we evaluate a patient for treatment, we do a special scan called a PET scan that gives a radioactive tracer that can go anywhere that the cancer is. And you can see that this spot here that we knew about is very, very bright with the tracer but there's also a spot of cancer in the bone. That spot of cancer spread is called a metastasis. 
When there's more than one, we say metastases. And when someone has had a cancer spread like this, when someone has metastatic cancer, that is what causes the problems with cancer. And that makes cancer, for the most part, incurable. Let me show you a bit about how these metastases cause problems. What cancer does is it uses the bloodstream as a highway, just like the 401, maybe not blocked, but a free way to go to travel to different parts of the, of, of the body. And so here you can see that this patient, unfortunately, has had cancer that has spread to the brain. This patient has had cancer spread to the lungs. This patient has had cancer spread to the liver. And this is a bone scan showing cancer that has spread to several bones. And when the cancer spreads to these other areas, that's where it causes problems. It grows and it starts to interfere with the workings of that organ, like the brain or the liver or the lungs, maybe making somebody short of breath. But also, as the cancer spreads, it makes the patient weak, it makes them tired, it makes them feel unwell, and they gradually lose weight, they decline, they lose their appetite. I would estimate that probably 90% of patients who die of cancer die because of metastases. These spots that I'm showing you here are metastases that are very visible. The, and they all started with little single cells that have traveled through the bloodstream to land in their new home, in their new organ. The problem that we're facing, and one of the things that we're gonna be talking about today is that we can't detect little microscopic metastases. If there was a little cancer cell here or just a few, we would not be able to see them. They've gotta to grow to this size where they would, this would be millions or billions of cancer cells in a spot of this size. Let me just illustrate why it's a problem that we can't detect microscopic metastases. This was a patient of mine many years ago. This is a scan of their neck. This is as if we're facing them. These are the tops of their lungs. And they, they had here in their neck a lump. This is actually a collection of lymph nodes and a cancer nearby. This was thought to be a localized cancer with no apparent metastases. That we scanned them, there was nothing to see. So we gave them very aggressive treatment, seven weeks of radiation and high dose chemo. Shortly after that, they were, they were scanned with a, a PET scan like I showed you before. And there was one metastasis found, just one. And we thought, oh, there's only one metastasis. Let's be aggressive for that. And for a metastasis like this, you could put some, someone through surgery, you could give them radiation, trying to be aggressive. And we assumed that there was no cancer anywhere else because the PET scan didn't show anything. But a few weeks later, the patient became very unwell and I'm trying to figure out what was going on. They were ill. I thought, well, there can't be more spots of cancer because we just scanned them. But sure enough, I just scanned them again because I couldn't figure out what was going on. And sure enough, there was widespread cancer. And these did not arise suddenly, but they would have been microscopic spots of cancer that were there probably the whole time. And if we had known about this, we would have treated them a lot differently. And so the question is, and I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Allen now, the question is how do we address the fact that we can't detect microscopic cancer? So thanks David for that laying the sort of clinical problem out so well. And, um, this is really where the, the genesis of the metastasis research team came from, was from this clinical problem. So David is a fantastic oncologist, and yet he can't help a patient, you know, and he can't figure out how do we, how do we attack this problem. So a couple years ago, several years ago now, I think David and I locked ourselves in a room right beside that office where he's sitting right now, with some coffee and some markers and a whiteboard and for a couple of hours and we just brainstormed. Um, and David is, uh, as he told you, he's a cancer doctor, he's a radiation oncologist. I'm a scientist, I'm a PhD doctor, so I always say I'm a paper doctor. And so we come at problems from, we both know about cancer, but we come at problems from very different aspects. I come from the lab basis and he comes from, from the, the medical and patient basis. So we got together and we brainstormed. Our whiteboard did not look this pretty because we're not as artistic, but it had lots of great ideas and ultimately kind of came down to sort of four really high level ideas. So we knew we needed to figure out how to gain a greater understanding about how and why metastasis happened. 
So really the inner workings of those cancer cells and why they're spreading. We definitely needed to improve our ability to find these metastases when they're small and also to track them as they make their way through the body. Um, and both of these pieces would help us then develop more rational targeted personalized therapies for individual patients. And really to do all of this, we knew we couldn't, you know, one, one person couldn't do this or one group of radiation oncologists or one group of scientists couldn't do it. We really needed to get everyone on the team all together in a room to work together. And so that's where we really wanted to enhance the integration between the biology side and the clinical side. And so <clears throat> what we came up with and what we're gonna share with you today is the Metastasis Translational Research Team at the London Regional Cancer Program. And um, London is actually, many of you will already know um, that London is actually already known for its world leading um, researchers, both on the basic science side and the clinical side who work in the area of metastasis, both understanding the biology and treating metastasis. And so we developed this team um, that had four pillars, what we thought were the four important pillars. So those were biology, that's the understanding, the, the how and the why, biomarkers and imaging, that's the tracking and making, you know, getting us better ways of finding these metastases and keeping track of them. And then the therapeutics pillar. And the other really important thing is that they're not, you'll see the little arrows in between, they're not standalone pillars. They all talk to each other and information we learn in one pillar will inform what we're doing in the other pillars. So um, it's very much a team and an integrated effort. And uh, throughout the course of today, you're gonna hear a little bit about each one of these, these pillars and how they're working together. So the other really exciting thing that the Pam introduced at the beginning is that we are the first team of this kind in Canada that's really focused specifically on this complex problem of metastasis um, with the ultimate goal of improving the lives of patients and their families. And so today uh, we're gonna give you a snapshot of some of the work that we're doing. We're obviously super excited about it and hopefully by the end of it, you will be as well. So we're gonna start out um, with Dr. Palma and Dr. Wynn, who are gonna talk about um, some of the really exciting um, clinical trials and uh, including new therapeutics and new imaging. Um, and then I'm going to, myself and Dr. Bat are gonna go um, give you a glimpse into the type of work that we're doing in the lab in developing these biomarkers. Um, and then Deborah, Dr. Heb and Dr. Wong are going to talk um, specifically about new approaches for brain metastases. And then we'll wrap up at the end with a Q&A session. And so I'd like to highlight, um, as Pam said, feel free to type questions into the Q&A tab um, throughout the presentations. We will we'll answer them all at the end. Um, but if sometimes it's easier just to write something down quickly as you think about it rather than waiting to the end. So feel free to drop that into the Q&A um, and we'll, we promise we'll get to it um, at the end. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it back to Dr. Palma and Dr. Wynn to get us started. Excellent. Thank you, Allison. And I encourage you, any questions, if you, simple, complex, uh, whatever you want to ask, uh, go ahead. Um, so the, for the next section, uh, Tim and I are going to uh, talk to you a little bit about radiation. We're both radiation doctors. Uh, Tim, if you want to share your slides, and um, hopefully we'll enthuse you about some of the new technologies that we have here. We're really lucky to have Dr. Wynn with us. He's a, um, he's a, a highly sought after a radiation oncologist, and we were happy to bring him back to London. Tim's going to introduce himself a little bit, and then we'll get into our slides. Thanks, uh, David. Just make sure... Yeah. Um, so as uh, as Dr. Pond mentioned, I, I'm one of his colleagues. I'm a radiation oncologist as well here at the London Regional Cancer Program, and I treat patients with cancer using radiation uh, as well, that uh, cancer affecting the brain, spine, uh, liver, and, and pancreas. And uh, in this sh short presentation, um, we're hoping to highlight just how far radiation treatment has come over the last few decades, and also share some of the completed, ongoing, and soon-to-be-initiated research uh, in metastatic cancer. 
and again, by metastatic meaning cancer that spread uh, from the starting point to other areas of, of the body. So London is actually a big part of radiation treatment history, as some of you may know. This is an old radiation treatment machine called a cobalt-60 unit. And um, using this machine, the first ever um, treatment of a cancer patient um, was here in London, in Victoria Hospital in 1951. And treatment um, with radiation relies on imaging to help guide where the radiation beams go. And so older treatments use fairly simplistic uh, imaging, such as this um, x-ray here that's a 2D image. And so this patient here um, has a small lung tumor. It's hard to see, but this arrow will show you this faint white area here is, is the tumor. So in the old days, the way we used to treat this tumor would be to put essentially a square field around it. And then a beam would pass through the front of the, the, the patient's body and through the back. So two beams passing through that square, and that's how it would be treated. In a similar way, um, patients that have brain metastases, so uh, tumors that have spread from somewhere to, to the brain, uh, could be treated with something called whole brain radiation. And this is something that we still use today in uh, select cases, but back in the olden days, this was the only approach that we had. So all patients, whether they had one brain tumor or 20 brain tumors would receive this type of treatment. And so the images here on the left hand, you see the pink, which is the, the area that's receiving the full dose of radiation, which is essentially the whole brain. Uh, and then on the, the right hand here, you see uh, an image as if the patient's facing you. And the two lines, so the two green lines at the top and the bottom, are one beam passing through the side of their head. And the two pink lines on the other side is the other beam. So again, two beams passing through the brain to, to treat the tumor and a lot of normal brain as well. So this um, video here shows just how far we've come. This is a patient receiving radiation. They're lying on the treatment table. This is the actual arm of the radiation machine moving around them um, as the treatment's going on. So with this technique, I'll play it one more time, you can see that you're able to get multiple different angles, directions. Um, and so instead of just that simplistic two beams passing through, uh, you get multiple beams and allows you to give much more precise treatment. Here's another picture of uh, one of the treatment units on the right. Um, here is um, Deb Matthews, a former uh, deputy premier who uh, came for a tour a few years back. And on the left-hand side is uh, Dr. Stu Gady, who's one of our medical physicists and actually now the head of our medical physics uh, division. So one approach that we can use um, to treat patients using these modern machines is something called serotactic ablative radiation therapy or SABER uh, for short. And you give uh, radiation oncologists an acronym like that and we can't help ourselves make some Star Wars references. So see Luke Skywalker here. And so this illustrates what, what SABER looks like. Um, it's a similar image to what Dr. Palma showed before. So this dark gray line across the bottom is the table. The patient's lying on their back, the two dark, half moon shapes here are the lungs. And here's the lung tumor here. So that yellow shaded area represents the lung tumor. And then these rings, the red, the green, the blue, these are the radiation doses. So the highest radiation dose would be in the red. And you can see how it really tightly hugs the, the tumor area. And so with this technique, you're able to give these very high doses very close to the tumor. And as you move away, the green is a lower dose and the blue is even lower. So that just illustrates how as you move away from the tumor, the doses fall off or decrease. And so you can spare radiation to the rest of your normal tissue very well. In the brain, um, to make things more confusing, we change the terminology. So it's this, the same idea, but instead of calling it SABER, we call it SRS or stereotactic radio surgery. The word surgery is in it, but there's no surgery involved. It's all radiation. Um, here's a, a picture here of, of a brain. So this is as if someone cut the top off someone's head, looking straight down at their brain. And this is a tumor, as you can see on this side, on the patient's right. And the green just shows you how tightly the radiation you can essentially hug around uh, the tumor and give these precise um, doses that avoid a lot of normal brain. And because you're treating mostly tumor and, and not much brain, you're able to increase the dose to very high uh, amounts. And it can be adaptive. And what I mean by that um, is that the radiation can take the shape of the tumor. So here are two examples of tumors that aren't nice spheres. That we've shown you so far a lot of tumors that are round and spherical, but some tumors are irregular in shape, such as these two. And using this technique with multiple beams, we're able to 
shape the radiation to whatever shape the tumor um, uh, appears to be. And on this slide with, with Yoda as, uh, as Urvana White, just showing you the two panels here, this is just giving you another look at other areas of the body that you can treat with SABR. So on the left-hand side, this is a, a tumor in the liver getting treated with SABR. And then on the right, this is uh, a tumor involving part of the bone of the spine. Uh, and so at this point, um, I'll hand over to Dr. Palma. He um, will be reviewing um, uh, some of the trials that have completed and ongoing in, in metastatic cancer. But it's good to have Yoda on your side. So one thing that is of a big research focus, both here and around the world, is the treatment of patients who only have a few spots of cancer, a few metastases. And the word for just a few is oligo. So the term that is used in medicine, you know, why use a simple term when you can use a complicated one, is oligometastasis. So it used to be thought that if somebody had metastases like this, then they're not curable. Generally, patients with oligometastases have been considered to be incurable. And the thought was always that if there are one or two or three spots, and there's going to be other spots that pop up, the horses out of the barn, and there's no point in doing aggressive treatments that could have some potential side effects. But, you know, with our ability to detect smaller and smaller spots of cancer, we thought that maybe treating one, two, or three spots of cancer might be beneficial. So we did a trial to see if this stereotactic radiation that Tim was talking about could extend survival and even cure some patients. And this trial that we did was called the SABER Comet trial. SABER is the stereotactic radiation. And Comet just stood for Comprehensive Treatment of Metastases, so SABER Comet. And we had patients from London and around the world uh, over about a five-year period. We said, hey, we have this new treatment. Do you want to join this study? And if they did want to join the study, they would enter the study and a computer would flip a coin. This was a randomized trial, and the patient would either get SABER to all their spots of cancer, or they would get standard treatments, standard palliative treatments, not meant to cure the cancer, just to slow things down like chemo and lower dose radiation. And we tried to see if we could improve the median survival, the median amount of time that someone was alive, or you could also say the average survival is almost the same thing. And so what we found in the 99 patients that enrolled, who had mostly one, two, or three spots of cancer, is that this group here that had the standard palliative treatments, they survived about 28 months on average. But the people who got the stereotactic radiation to all the spots of cancer, it was substantially longer. It was 52 months. And this was really the first strong evidence that SABER can improve how long people live. And we found that out of it, for every six, pa for every six patients who entered the trial and got the SABER, one of those six would be alive at, at five years with no cancer having come back, which some people say is a, is a surrogate for cure. So they're, we're not curing everybody, but we are probably curing some who would otherwise have been considered incurable. And this was published in The Lancet, which is a medical journal that, um, that usually publishes high impact studies. So this is suggesting that this is something that is potentially changing what people are doing around the world. And so we thought, well, if we can treat one, two, or three spots of cancer, how about more? And so we opened a study called Saber Comet 10. This is a patient with Saber on Saber Comet 10 who has nine spots, nine oligometastases throughout the lungs that we all treated. Saber Comet 10 is for patients with four to 10 oligometastases. It's currently running in Canada, Europe, and in Australia. Um, we've enrolled about half the patients already in two years, and enrollment is going very well. We're going to be finishing next year. And this is the only study looking at treating so many spots of cancer. If, we can, if the study shows that we can improve survival, then this will become the new standard treatment. And the exciting thing about this is that this study is fully funded by the London Health Sciences Foundation just showing the impact of these donations on patient care directly. So I'll hand it back over to Tim for a couple more slides, and then, uh, and then we'll hand off to Allison after that. So taking it a step further um, from a Saber uh, Comet uh, 10, um, another trial um, that we have ongoing here is uh, what we call the ARREST trial. And uh, that's being led by Dr. Glenn Bauman, but both myself and Dr. Palma are involved uh, as well. And so this is looking at patients with 11 to 50 metastases, it's quite a, a, a larger number, and it's a phase one study. So what we mean by that is 
we're really focused on looking at, is this treatment safe when we're treating so many and what are the side effects? And we're trying to find what's the, the best dose, what's the most appropriate dose if we're doing something like this. And so the study looks at four different dose levels, level one being the lowest and level four being the highest. And gradually, as one level is found to be safe, we move up incrementally through these levels. And if, you, if we reach the, the final level, then that's where the study ends. If uh, a level is found to have too many side effects, then that's, that's where we stop. So this is still ongoing. Um, and we're currently in level three right now. And this is a preview of uh, what's to come. So this is still um, uh, in the woodworks, but this is uh, REST2, so the sort of the sequel to REST1 and also building upon the Sabre Comet uh, 10 trial. So this is looking at patients with over 10 metastases. And these patients will be randomized to receive uh, Sabre to all sites of, of disease or all sites of cancer. And the question is, will Sabre be beneficial in slowing down or delaying cancer growth and then potentially extending people's lives? So current, a general approach that we um, currently follow for patients with many metastases, over 10 metastases, is usually some type of drug treatment like chemotherapy. So we call that first-line chemotherapy, the first uh, chemotherapy that they try. And usually patients are, are continuing on that until the cancer grows, indicating that that chemotherapy is no longer effective at controlling the cancer. And so often the next line or second line chemotherapy is started. So what we hope to see in, in this um, trial is can SABRE or radiation be used as another line of treatment? So in the same um, situation, first line chemotherapy, once there's cancer uh, has shown itself to grow, could we use SABRE to treat all the visible sites of metastases and control or, or slow down the growth for a period of time? And then when it shows growth again, move on to the second line of chemotherapy. So by inserting radiation there, um, the hope is we could add another line of treatment, thereby delaying progression, hopefully extending lives um, that way. So what I wanted to, to note about this trial is um, we were actually quite happy to have received word that it's received funding as well from a grant that we applied for. Uh, but a major reason why we were successful in that grant was because it's building on the success of the previous trials that Dr. Pollan mentioned, Comet and Comet 10, um, which received um, funding from, from donors. And so um, although this trial is not funded directly from donation, it's indirectly being supported and just goes to show that um, the foundation and the gener generosity of, of donors who contribute to, to research, it not only funds one trial, but can have impact and, and support multiple subsequent trials as well. So that concludes uh, our, our presentation. And so um, I'll just stop sharing and I'll, I'll hand it back. And um, if any questions, I'll, I'll be on myself and Dr. Palmer, happy to address them at the end of, of all the talks. Yeah, great, thank you. And so we're gonna hand it back to Pam, uh, who is then going to introduce Dr. Allen. And we'd like to welcome back Dr. Allison Allen, and she will be speaking to understanding and tracking the cancer as it spreads. Great, thank you, Pam. So thanks again, everybody, um, for uh, joining us today. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about um, what we're doing in the lab and what the, on the biology side, how we're supporting um, oncologists like Dr. Palma and Dr. Wim in, in carrying out these trials. Um, and at the same time, learning more about cancer metastasis. So one of the reasons, so you might, um, you know, you sort of think we've been studying cancer for a long time. Why is metastasis still such a challenge? Um, and one of the reasons is that it's really a very complicated process. Um, and just like Dr. Wynn said that radiation treatment, there was some first in London in terms of um, radiation treatment. In metastasis biology, there is also some firsts, and some of the kind of key understandings that we have about how metastasis works actually came out of studies in London, out of Dr. Chambers, Dr. Groom, and Dr. McDonald's labs in the um, mid to late 90s. And so what they uncovered through very careful studies is sort of how this spread actually happened. So Dr. Palma introduced you to the idea that um, these cancer cells escape uh, escape um, into the bloodstream. And they do so because when a 
primary tumor, for example, in the breast or the prostate or the pancreas gets to a certain size, it actually gets so that it needs a way to get oxygen and food and nutrients to it. And so it convinces the body to start to grow some new blood vessels. And the appearance of these blood vessels, as well as bringing food and oxygen in to the tumor also provides an opportunity for these tumor cells to escape out into the bloodstream, get on the highway, like, like David said, get on the 401 and travel. And what happens is they go through big wide blood vessels um, in your body, and then eventually they get into these small tiny blood vessels called capillaries in the beds of organs like the lung and the liver. And they actually get jammed up just by size restriction. So they kind of hit like a, a tiny part and they get stuck. And then what happens is they can either die there or they may sort of eventually decide this is not a very comfortable place to be. I'm going to push out and invade out of the blood vessel into this brand new organ. And then at that spot, they have a couple of decisions um, or a couple of jobs that they have to do. They might either stay as just a single cancer cell and they, many of them actually will just die because it's now a foreign environment. They used to be a prostate in the prostate and now they go into the liver, it's actually a very foreign environment and they, they just decide they can't live there. So they die, which is great, which is exactly what we want. They might also kind of go, yeah, I don't really know if I, if I can make it here, but I'm just going to kind of hang out and sleep and stay dormant for a while. So these cancer cells are still alive, but they haven't decided what they're going to do. So they just sort of stay just as single cells or these cells could go on and grow. And this is when the cancer starts to progress. Um, and they may grow into uh, what we call a micrometastasis. And again, at this stage, they have, again, they might die off. Um, they could remain dormant, so they don't, they don't get any bigger, but they don't get any smaller. Or they could go on to grow, again, to what we call a macrometastasis. And then they might need to recruit another source of blood vessels. And then the whole process can they can seed each other and get to that stage that you saw in Dr. Palma's presentation where there's widespread metastases. And you'll also remember that Dr. Palma said that sometimes it looks like a tiny spot, but it's really like millions, you know, or sometimes billions of cells. And so our current imaging technologies actually only really pick up metastases at this stage, maybe some at this stage, they're getting a little better. But by this time, it's often much more difficult to treat because they're, you know, they're starting to grow really quickly. So we want it in the lab, in my lab, we're really aimed at trying to understand how do the cells decide, make all these decisions about growing, dying, sleeping, and how can we stop that? And also how can we find them at earlier stages? Um, so these are, you know, kind of, the way the types of questions that we ask in the lab and that's you know back to this how does metastasis occur what is the underlying biology what genes and proteins either help or stop cancer cells from spreading um, we also ask experimental questions in the lab about why some cancers or some patients develop metastases while others don't i'm sure you've heard lots of stories of you know two patients with prostate cancer and one does just fine and one eventually progresses and gets bone metastasis. And what is, what is the underlying biology that determines um, why one patient gets metastasis and another doesn't? Um, we also wanna know when will metastasis happen? Sometimes we think the cancer is cured, um, but actually some of these cells have already escaped and we don't know when they're gonna wake up and grow or when they're gonna you know, move from a small you know, for example, a small oligometastases or a limited number of oligometastases to um, widespread metastases. And then the where. So we already learned about all the different organs that these cancer cells can go to. So is there a way that we can figure out um, where they're going, how to find them, um, and how to get rid of them? So many of our studies in the lab are um, done in petri dishes. Um, they're also done in animal models, usually primarily in mice. Um, but then we, as we get down to sort of understanding some of these things, we also need to ask questions in a more um, 
patient relevant model, um, which ultimately is humans in clinical trials. So this is where we start to work with people like Dr. Palma and Dr. Wynn um, and Dr. Hebb that we'll hear from later. And so how do we, obviously humans are not experimental subjects, humans are human patients. And so what we do is try to, in during the course of treatment um, in patients who are participating in clinical trials, we think about the, the um, aspects that, uh, we think about the, oh, what information can we gain from the patients that we can then take back to the lab to study? And so um, many people will be familiar um, with the concept that when you have cancer, um, as part of your treatment plan, you will get a tissue biopsy. And that will be usually typically from the primary tumor. Um, so from the lung tumor, from the pancreatic tumor, from the breast tumor. And this is standard procedure, and the pathologist uses this information to, um, to stage, provide you with some staging information, uh, potentially some treatment information. And, um, but for a patient with metastatic disease, widespread met metastatic disease, um, imagine that you need to biopsy every single one of these lesions. So this becomes very difficult, um, potentially risky, certainly invasive. Um, and so typically in the metastatic setting, we can only sample one site of disease at a time. And um, so this doesn't give us information because every single one of these metastases might actually have different characteristics. It also just lets us really, we can't do this over and over again for the reasons of invasiveness and risk. So it just gives us an idea um, on you know, February the 3rd, this is what the tumor looked like, but we know that uh, we know that um, we know that cancer changes its characteristics. That's one of the ways it survives. Is it actually is constantly evolving and changing and adapting. And so, having just a single snapshot um, about what the tissue looks like is not necessarily going to be accurate to treating the patient over months or years. So this is where this idea of a liquid biopsy comes in. Um, which is really an emerging approach that's um, being used for metastasis, um, certainly in clinical trials research, but also um, emerging as an approach that's used for treating patients as well. And so it's a simple um, blood test. And so it's relatively minimally invasive. It's easy to collect blood along with other blood work that's being done as part of your normal care. And if you can imagine, picture again, this idea of the cancer cells on the in the bloodstream on the highway, it means that we're possibly capturing information from all of the different metastases and not just one single site. And also because it's relatively straightforward, we can um, repeat it um, multiple times, you know, once a month, every six months, once a year. Um, and so it provides us potentially with a lot more information to work with. The other from a, um, a lab perspective and a biology perspective is that the blood in um, a patient with cancer is actually a very rich source of information. So you can see here in the bloodstream, there's all these different components. And some of the ones that we're really interested in, so again, here's the primary tumor, here's the cells that are escaping into the bloodstream. So we have, um, as a very uh, simple starting point, we have these circulating tumor cells or CTCs. And what we can do with these when we find them is we can just count them. It's really straightforward. We can either count them at the beginning when a patient is just starting treatment or coming onto a clinical trial. And that might tell us you know, how much metastases or what the burden of metastases they have if they have a lot of circulating tumor cells. And if we look again after treatment and those cells go down, then that's indicative to us that the treatment is working. Um, we can also you know, track appearance of metastases. So if a patient comes in and they have no CTCs at the beginning, but then we're kind of looking at it every six months, if we start to see CTCs in the blood or circulating tumor cells in the blood, that could mean that could be an early indicator of metastasis coming back. Another um, really interesting thing that we find in the blood is 
um, the circulating tumor DNA or ctDNA. And this is DNA that actually um, gets shed when a cancer cell is in the blood, but then it dies. Um, and but it, it releases basically the DNA into the bloodstream. And we can harvest that DNA and we can actually subject it to um, sophisticated genomic sequencing, just like you may have heard of next generation sequencing. And we can look at um, all the different genes and the different mutations and um, start to see if there are patterns in certain patients that, that suggest that these mutations might be the ones that are helping to drive the metastasis or might be either helping or hindering a response to treatment, um, such as the radiation treatment that, that you heard about earlier. And then finally, the last component that we're really interested in in the blood are just your body's own immune cells. And by looking at these immune cells and how they change over time, um, it can tell us whether or not the patient's body is dynamically turning on or off your immune system in response to the cancer um, or even in response to treatment. So your immune system, we hope is, is if we can activate the immune system by giving certain treatments, that means that your own body can help to fight that cancer along with the radiation or the chemotherapy. And so by being able to track these in the blood over time will give us some information about that. So how are we applying all of these things? So in the context of, of Dr. Wynn and Dr. Palma's um, introduction, we're really interested in this idea. So we heard some really exciting um, um, outcomes of some of the trials that are going on at LHSC um, with regards to SABRE. And the expectation or sort of the, the reason that these patients get enrolled on this trial is because they are believed to be, you know, they meet all the clinical criteria that they're believed to be truly oligometastatic. So they have just those few, um, those few small numbers of metastases. However, um, as Dr. Palma introduced, sometimes we think they only have a few oligometastases, but actually they have widespread disease that just didn't appear right away and, and then kind of quickly appeared. And then we know that, um, that in that case, actually these patients are not gonna have a lot of benefit from SABRE and we would be better off treating them more aggressively um, or differently with another, another point of therapy or even just um, moving towards a more palliative approach to treatment. And so what we wanna do with these biomarkers is actually try to figure out if these biomarkers, these circulating tumor cells, the cell-free DNA, and the immune profiling can actually define for us um, as these patients are being treated or even before they're being treated, whether or not they fall into one, one of these categories. And so um, we're looking at um, in the course of all of these trials that were um, described earlier, in parallel with the patients being treated on these trials, we're collecting blood samples and we're analyzing all these blood biomarkers. And then we're gonna be comparing those uh, features back to the clinical outcomes and the clinical characteristics of each patient. And ultimately our goal is to create um, the very first biology driven multi biomarker um, panel to help define the oligometastatic patient. And that this could be used for um, clinical decision-making uh, in hopefully in the near future. Um, and so ultimately all of this together, you know, the goal of the whole team is to really to challenge that um, current clinical paradigm that was introduced at the beginning where, you know, right now patients with metastases might be considered incurable, but if, if we take all of this biology information and all this clinical information, can we actually change that so that um, some of this, these patients are um, highly treatable or even curable? Um, so with that, I'll just wrap up um, to just highlight, um, many of you know this already, but the impact of donor support on this kind of research is just irreplaceable. It really facilitates world-class cutting-edge translational research where the clinicians and, the, and the, the basic scientists are working together, and we can really focus on some of the really big challenges of cancer, which, um, which in this case is metastasis. 
Um, as we said, this is a unique program in Canada internationally, but really, really importantly for donor funding allows us to tackle what we call high risk, high reward ideas. And those are the kind of um, ideas that we need to move the bar um, significantly in cancer, but they're often the kind of ideas that traditional grant funding agencies and governments are just not, it's too risky. They're not willing to kind of put their money into it. So donor funding and your faith in us in kind of trying these crazy high risk ideas that potentially have a huge impact um, is just so important for our research. And so ultimately um, it helps us develop and deliver personalized and more effective cancer treatments for patients with metastatic cancer um, and ultimately positions London as world leaders in this area um, and also impacts uh, cancer care um, and, and changes practice on an international level. Um, so with that, I would just like to say a giant thank you um, and as with the others, if people have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll come back and cover them um, at the end. Yes, so thank you, Dr. Allen, Dr. Palma, and Dr. Wynn. It's pretty incredible what you're doing and what's happening here and how it's changing patient care. So thank you so much for those informative presentations. Our next speaker will be Dr. Vasu Bhatt. Dr. Bott is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology. He is co-supervised by Dr. Allison Allen and Dr. David Palma. He is involved in a phase three clinical trial aimed at defining oligometastatic state in cancer patients using blood-based biomarkers. He is also studying the role of the lung microenvironment in influencing metastatic behavior of breast cancer stem cells. His research projects are supported by Breast Cancer Society of Canada. Dr. Bott is coming to us live from the lab and will be doing a practical demonstration of research in action. Um, so I'm Vasu, I'm a postdoctoral associate. Uh, Dr. Palma, Dr. Venn, and Dr. Allen already introduced us to the study that we are conducting uh, at our centers. And uh, Dr. Allen mentioned that uh, blood can be very informative as it contains different indicators and uh, how that can be used to study treatment response and also study disease status. Um, I will be giving you a brief practical demonstration of what we do in the lab once we receive blood samples from patients. I guess everyone here have undergone blood tests and uh, these blood tests would have been to look at levels of glucose or urea or creatinine um, uh, at different times. And uh, similarly, we use blood to look at different indicators. As Dr. Alan mentioned earlier, we call these as blood-based biomarkers. And we don't need a lot of blood to do this. We just need one and a half tablespoon of blood. Okay. So once we get blood from patients, the first thing we do is that we separate out components of blood and we use an instrument called a centrifuge to separate out the components. I want you to imagine the speed at which um, a propeller or a fan blade of aircraft engine rotates it rotates at very high speed, right? So we use same speed here to separate out components. We, these tubes are spin at that high speed. And once that is done, the components get separated. As you can see here, it was red earlier, and now you can see the blood has two different layers. So the top layer, which is lighter, the pale yellow colored solution, we call it plasma. And it contains one of the blood-based biomarkers that is tumor DNA that is shed from tumor cell. And this part is referred to as solid blood component. This contains RBC, red blood cells. And along with that, it contains another blood-based biomarker that is immune cells. And these immune cells have the ability to fight against cancer. Now, how do we isolate or study the third biomarker, that is the tumor cell itself, which has entered blood circulation. For that, we take half a tablespoon of blood in a special tube. 
and we add special buffer to that. It's already taken blood in the special tube. Now this buffer helps or prevents cells from clumping together and it also protects the cells. If cells are damaged, then we won't get, all our results will be negative. So we won't be able to help patients or understand what is happening with uh, the treatment or uh, their disease status. So we mix this and we do the same thing. We spin this uh, blood at a very high speed. Once that is done, again, this is how it looks. So you get two different layers, the plasma and the solid blood content. And we use this uh, to run it on a very sophisticated instrument, which is FDA and Health Canada approved instrument called as cell search. Unfortunately, the instrument is in a different place, so I won't be able to take you there but this is how it looks. Now what this instrument does is it adds a few more components to the blood so that uh, it identifies its target. So these components are somewhat, I can say, colored components. So it goes and binds to its target. It won't bind to anything else. It only binds to its targets. And we call these targets as proteins. Now, imagine this is the component that the instrument adds to blood. And this is a target or the protein that is present on a cell. It goes and binds. Now imagine instead of this, you have a different target, the component won't bind to it, right? And if this component, if this target is absent, then it won't bind to anything else. So, the, uh, so you won't get any signal. So once there is binding, this will give a color to the cells. So if it is not present, then you won't see any color. And that's how we um, identify tumor cells. So this is an example how the picture looks. So instrument, what it does is once that is done, it scans all the cells and take pictures and gives it to us. And this is an example how tumor cell looks. Now, if you look at this, so, this tumor cell contains two components, that is two features, but it does not contain this feature. If this feature is present, then they are non-tumor cells. So the tumor cells should contain these two features and they should overlap. And if any one of the any one of these are absent, then you, these are considered as non-tumor cells. So we get around 100 to 1,000 uh, images. We have to go through all the images and sometimes there will be human error. Just to prevent that, what we do is that two independent researchers analyze this and we identify tumor cell. And this is how, this is the procedure that we undertake to identify tumor cells in blood and uh, isolate other blood-based biomarkers. So these are the few things that we do in the lab with an objective to uh, find new ways to detect, treat, and also prevent uh, spread of cancer in patients. Um, with that, I would like to thank everyone for your patience and support. If you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A box to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bott, for taking us behind the scenes and into the lab for that very, very exciting and interesting presentation. Our final presenters of the day will be Dr. Matthew Hebb and Dr. Eugene Wong. Dr. Matthew Hebb is an associate professor neurosurgeon and scientist in the Department of Clinical Neurological Sciences. Dr. Hebb completed his PhD in neuroscience and pharmacology at Dalhousie University, then obtained his MD at the University of Toronto. 
He returned to Dalhousie for neurosurgery residency training, then moved to Phoenix, Arizona to complete a fellowship in complex cranial surgery at the Barrow Neurological Institute. Dr. Hebb's clinical practice focuses on brain cancer surgery, and he also directs a molecular and cellular research laboratory that aims to better understand the drivers of brain cancer and establish effective new strategies for management. Dr. Eugene Wong is currently professor of physics and astronomy, oncology and medical biophysics at Western University with 25 years of medical physics experience. After completing a medical physics residency at the London Regional Cancer Program, he led a team to implement image-guided radiotherapy. For about a decade, he was responsible for generating computerized treatment plans for complex patient cases. In collaboration with biologists and imaging scientists, Eugene initiated the Oncology Physics Laboratory in 2006 and has since been working on novel imaging and treatments for cancer patients, including those diagnosed with brain metastasis. Dr. Hebb and Dr. Wong will be speaking to treating cancers that travel to the brain. Uh, I want to first uh, thank everybody for attending. And this is my first time uh, uh, being involved uh, with an event like this. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. This is really fantastic. And it's fantastic to see the, the breadth of uh, uh, research that's being done uh, for metastatic disease. Uh, so as you heard, I'm a, a neurosurgeon. I work at University Hospital primarily, and my focus of uh, the practice is uh, primarily brain cancers. And we see an awful lot of people with terrible disease, and uh, it is a tremendous motivator uh, for trying to think outside the box and uh, address some of the unique problems that we see in patients who have brain cancer. Uh, what I've shown here is a, a scan of a patient who uh, presented uh, last month uh, into the emergency department with terrible neurologic problems. And uh, on her uh, MRI scan, uh, you can see that uh, she has these uh, large areas of cancer tumors uh, in the back of the brain uh, in an area called the cerebellum. Uh, this patient has a history of breast cancer that was treated uh, just two years prior uh, with very good results. Uh, and the control in the body uh, was excellent right up until um, she came uh, to see me. When we see tumors like this, uh, we can think about surgery, which is one of the main pillars of uh, cancer treatment in the brain. And indeed, we did operate and we took those tumors out. Uh, and she did very well from that perspective. But the problem is that, uh, as you've seen in some other slides from other presenters, that this is not a focal disease. Uh, this patient had other tumors that were identified in different regions of the brain uh, that were not accessible to the surgical corridor and uh, therefore uh, were not removed. So something else needs to be offered uh, for this situation. So we think about treatments of brain cancer in particular, it's a bit unique compared to other cancers in the body in that we have um, surgery as a pillar, but uh, just like the other areas, we have chemotherapy and radiation. In the brain, the brain tissue is uh, protected somewhat from uh, blood and the components of the blood, as well as drugs that get put into the blood. And uh, so there's a, a barrier called the blood-brain barrier, uh, which exists between the blood vessels that travel through the brain and actually the brain tissue on the other side of those vessels. And so many types of uh, therapies that are being developed and work quite well in the body actually don't make it uh, into the brain at, at enough at high enough levels to affect treatment there. In addition, radiation uh, is the third pillar of treatment for these type of cancers. Uh, but like you've seen and heard uh, from the other presenters, 
there are a number of different uh, hurdles that are being uh, worked on. And in the brain, particularly, the number and the size of the tumor really limits the ability to treat these with radiation. And radiation, generally speaking, is a one-time treatment. And uh, so if a tumor ends up failing radiation over time, to treat that again, retreat it with radiation, puts that patient at higher risk for complications. So the brain is an interesting area in many respects, but just as you think of uh, why weeds and soil would grow, it's uh, related to the particular composition of the soil that makes it uh, attractive for the weeds. You can have a similar analogy to tumors that grow in the brain. There are particular characteristics of tumors that will uh, seed themselves into the brain and then grow in the brain. One thing that, uh, that we've been trying to uh, understand is the role of uh, electric fields in the brain and in brain cancers. Now, we are all electrical creatures. Everything our body does, all the functions from top to bottom are at some level controlled by electrical activity. And in particular, the nervous system is a very highly electric uh, organ uh, and uh, Neurosurgeons for years have been using uh, mechanisms of altering the natural electric fields in the uh, central nervous system to treat uh, various disorders, such as pain, epilepsy, uh, psychiatric disease, movement disorders. These are all standard uh, indications for different types of stimulation therapies in the nervous system. So our group decided uh, to explore the uh, electrical environment of cancers that seed themselves in the brain, and in particular, the ability to gently disrupt that comfort zone that tumors may have uh, in their electrical environment to determine if we can specifically target tumors uh, while leaving brain function and integrity intact. And so what I've shown here is an example of a, of a patient with a deep tumor in, their, uh, in an eloquent area of the brain called the thalamus. This is not an area that is readily accessible uh, for surgery. And so the tumor was biopsied and a diagnosis was obtained, uh, but then the patient is left with a large mass of tumor that then needs to depend on the other pillars of therapy uh, that frankly, in, in this situation, don't work very well. So we're looking at ways to create uh, uh, treatment fields uh, by directly targeting these type of locations with uh, parameters that don't alter the function of normal brain, don't injure normal brain, but have a particularly uh, high uh, success at killing off cancer cells. We've got a number of different preclinical models uh, that have uh, demonstrated huge promise for this potentially fourth pillar of brain cancer treatment. Uh, what I've shown here is one of our, uh, what we call in vitro or, or benchtop uh, models where we can study three-dimensional tumor responses from patients uh, we can have very stringent control of the electric fields that we create in this chamber where we would have growing tumors and you can see connected to what we call a waveform generator or basically a, a, a device that, that creates specific parameters of electric fields that we dictate. And then we can, we can uh, study the response of these tissues. What I'm showing here on the right is something called uh, bioluminescence imaging, which is a way to study the metabolism and viability of cancer cells in the dish. And so on the left side of the picture, you can see a patient breast cancer uh, that was removed from the brain and exposed only to control conditions, what we call sham. So it had all the setup, but no uh, 
IMT or intratumor modulation therapy was delivered. On the right side, uh, we had three days of this low energy electric field delivered across the tumor. And you can see that the viability of, of these cancer cells was dramatically reduced. Probably some of the most uh, recent and exciting data comes from uh, directly uh, stimulating brain cancer tissue obtained from the operating room. So my role in this type of research is highly privileged because I can have uh, the ability to take the tumor out or have one of my colleagues take the tumor out and have the lab team on standby ready to take the tissue on and process it for treatment and analysis. And so this can this tissue can move from the operating room into the lab literally within minutes. And what you can see here is uh, breast cancer uh, tissue. Uh, this is the initial patient that I showed you early on. Uh, we resected this particular area and sent it uh, to the pathologist for evaluation, but also a portion of it went to the lab and we uh, stimulated it or treated it with control conditions. And then after we were done, we stained the tissue with a what we call a viability stain or a, a, a marker of cell um, viability or how alive the tissue is. And if the tissue is alive, it will stain dark. If the tissue is dead, it will stain pale. And so you can see the difference here with the IMT treated uh, versus sham or tumor tissue directly from the brain that uh, really had no treatment whatsoever. And so there's a drastic response, probably the first time that we've shown a direct response from whole patient brain cancers. And it's not just uh, metastatic disease, actually this type of an approach may uh, stretch out to uh, primary brain cancers. Uh, this particular panel is uh, showing a glioblastoma, which is probably the most common and aggressive primary brain cancer. So it uh, originates from the brain. And the same type of approach has been taken. And you can see that the, the paleness of the treated compared to the very much alive uh, control brain tumors. The other thing to note is that uh, these samples are still intact. The integrity, the physical integrity is intact. This type of an approach is not a, a laser or something that, that uh, pulverizes the tissue in any way, uh, but the cells in that tissue don't survive it. And so this makes it a very attractive type of an approach uh, to study in different types of brain cancers. We're moving forward to advance from uh, strictly in the dish to a more human scale evaluation of this new form of uh, brain cancer therapy. So we have access to cutting edge uh, human phantoms with the uh, human uh, size heads and brains that can be modified with various types of uh, tumor-like structures inside them. And we also have cutting edge uh, uh, surgery robots that are used on a regular basis in real-time uh, clinical situations for non-cancer patients that we can also use to study uh, this type of approach and hopefully soon to be able to translate this work into clinical trials. So I want to thank you again for, for listening uh, to me and to uh, for joining uh, and for all the support uh, the donor support, I can't say uh, how important it is. Uh, and from here, I'll hand it over to Dr. Wong. Um, so I'd like to just put our uh, research in perspective. Uh, the big three, we have surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and uh, lots of, there are lots of clinical trials that you heard uh, revolving around them. Um, the idea that uh, uh, Dr. Hap just presented uh, of using uh, electrical environment or disrupt the electrical environment in cancer is really new and, and it's like a seedling. And I, you can imagine Dr. Hap uh, putting fertilizer and pouring water on it every day. Um, 
So what we'd like to actually uh, do is to uh, uh, use oscillating electric field to disrupt the uh, environment in the brain. And what I'd like to in tell you is that we use like a battery power, like two volts. Um, compared to your electrical outlet, uh, which is 120 volts, uh, that's much lower. And compared to deep brain stimulation, uh, which Dr. Hap had uh, uh, talked about uh, for neurological disease, uh, it, they use also two folds for that. On the other hand, uh, for deep brain stimulation, we want to uh, uh, regulate the disease uh, part of the tumor, uh, of the, sorry, lesion, and uh, we stimulate uh, the uh, the brain with 150 hertz. That's sort of uh, 150 cycle per second. Uh, and that's sort of the natural brain operating environment that the neuron fires at that frequency. Um, compared to the outlet, it's 60 uh, cycle per second. And for our oscillating, oscillating electric field, we are using 10,000 to 200,000 cycle per second. So that's much, much bigger than or away from our, the, the normal brain operation frequency. Um, so what we want to do is like this. We want the voltages in an electric field in the brain around the tumor to be oscillating. This is a slow motion of it, of what we imagined. And so this is a gen very gentle therapy, uh, unlike uh, other treatment, uh, but, it can, but it can be on 24 to seven. Um, and like I said, it would be safe because it's not uh, in the brain natural frequency. The issue we are facing is that with deep brain stimulations, we are targeting uh, lesions that are about one millimeter in size. But tumors uh, cancer in, in the brain is of the size of centimeters. So very quickly we realized that we need multiple electrodes uh, to be implanted into the tumor to provide this uh, adequate coverage. And I'd like to show you how we do it um, uh, uh, in our uh, new planning system. So first we would uh, have the patient go through uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And then we will uh, plan where the electrodes go and, and generate the electric field in the computer. And then we'll take the uh, plan and deliver it in the lab uh, prior, to deliver, uh, prior to delivering to patients. So what I'd like to do is show you part step two and three in the next two slides. So here's an image of uh, a patient uh, from uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And what we can do is uh, we can peel away the skull and leaving us with the brain. So we can visualize the brain and now we can take away the brain and, and look at the images directly. I'm panning now the brain image uh, to the patient's left and back to the patient's right or middle. And you don't have to be an expert uh, to realize that that's a tumor right there. And if you pan to the right, you can see that the patient is clear of other cancers except for this one lesion. So we segmented, we delineate uh, the, tu the tumor, and then we put it back in respect to the brain uh, and with the skull there, and we try to locate uh, the best position to put in electrodes uh, and the number as well. And the computer treatment planning system uh, will then uh, determine uh, and move these electrodes around uh, and, and determine the stimulation parameters to give us a high electric field, relatively high in the, in the tumor and zero. When you see blue here, there's no electric field there. So we can confine the electric field delivery in the tumor. So with this planning system, it's all good. Uh, and we can um, uh, uh, predict how much the, uh, the, on the computer, how much the tumor is getting. 
um, but there's nothing like delivering it uh, uh, to, to validate it. So we have a, a robot here uh, that Dr. Hap also used in his clinic, uh, and, but this is done in a lab environment. We have the human head phantom that Dr. Hap uh, talked to you about, uh, show you a little bit on one slide. And then we have this donut is a uh, CT scanner. So we uh, loaded our treatment plan into the robot computer and asked the robot to move the arm uh, to where the, uh, where the, where the uh, trajectory is for the uh, insertion for the uh, deep brain stimulation electrode. So here the uh, robot is holding a cannula that is, has been inserted into uh, the phantom here. And here's my student's hand and she is inserting the deep brain in electrode into this uh, uh, phantom. Uh, when we're done, we have multiple cables coming out. And I can assure you that Dr. Hap doesn't use uh, masking tape or duct tape in the OR, uh, but this is a physics experiment. So we use tape to hold all the electrodes uh, together. Once we have done that, uh, we connected the, uh, these electrodes, uh, most of all, all but one of them, uh, to waveform generator to stimulate them. And we use the, the, the one that we don't uh, use to the, and connect it to the oscilloscope to measure what the output is. And then we compare the voltages that we measure at different locations uh, against uh, the one that generated from our planning system. And you can see here that actually within uncertainties, uh, the measurement uh, agreed uh, with what the planning system predicted. So with that, um, uh, the next step is really we want to deliver uh, such a treatment to a patient, um, but we're not quite there because we do not know what frequency is really optimal uh, to interfere each patient's cancer uh, growth. Every patient's uh, cancer is different. And then in metastatic case, the cancer can come from different parts of the body that makes it uh, more unique to each patient. And we need a clinical trial uh, um, to demonstrate that this is a safe, uh, safe uh, procedure, um, just like deep brain simulation. And, and we want to show uh, that it works in patients. So I'd like to acknowledge that we have been funded. Uh, um, this is a risky uh, pr uh, project, uh, just like how Dr. Allen described it. We were able to seek fund, uh, get funding uh, from Cancer Research Society and, and, and CERC. Um, but really without the, um, uh, uh, the support of the donors like yourself, uh, this would not be here uh, at all. So thank you very much. And I would like to pass this back to Pam. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Wong and Dr. Hebb for, again, another incredible presentation with some amazing work that you guys are doing. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, I would like to welcome back Dr. Palma and Dr. Allen for the question and answer part of our, our tour. And we do actually have, I think, five questions this afternoon. So our first one, what makes a patient eligible for Saber Comet 10 or the arrest studies? Yeah, so I can answer that. So each trial has its own criteria that has to be met for someone to come into the trial. And so for each trial, they have slightly different criteria, but basically for Saber Comet 10, we're looking for patients who previously had their cancer treated. Let's say they had a breast cancer five years ago, and, uh, and, and it was treated back then, but now it's come back. That is the situation we're looking for with these spots in new locations. And for, so for Sabre Comet 10, it can be up to 10. And then for the arrest trial, which Dr. Wynn talked about, it, uh, there's no limit. The limit is 50, which is, which is quite a lot. And one thing that struck me, I've seen these slides a lot because we talk about them all the time, but that is such a huge departure from what everybody else is doing. And sometimes, Huge departures are, are, are big, great ideas that work. Sometimes they don't, but uh, we can definitely test them that way. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Palma. 
Our second question for the Comet trial, what will the next steps be once it's done? Yeah, so this is a good question. So, the, so for the first Comet trial, which is people with one, two or three metastases, this is what we did after that. So that had um, about 100 patients, 99 patients, and that was a phase two trial, meaning it wasn't a really huge study that is needed to really prove and something and get it adopted around the world. So because of the results of that initial trial, we were able to go to a big funding agency that's called CIHR, and they funded a big trial, which is uh, now 300 patients or so. They, the total funding we've had for that trial is about a million dollars. So you can see how a little bit of data then lets you get a lot more funding as Dr. Allen was saying. So that the one step that we had was to do the same study in a larger population of patients, but also then to go on to the Sabre Comet 10 trial, four to 10 metastases and the rest. But what we really need is we really need these biomarkers. You know, we need to be able to know. So, so much has changed in our world. You know, like we all have our phones that are so different than they were 30 years ago. I offered to buy my daughter a flip phone as a joke and she was mortified. You know, we, that's, flip phones are amazing one time. Um, but, but, but for doctors, we're still in the dark around which patients are going to respond and which ones aren't. And that goes across, breath, across cancer. So for example, for women, women with breast cancer, Dr. Allen does a lot of breast cancer research. After a woman has breast cancer, after they've had their surgery, many of them get chemo. And they get chemo because for some patients, like 30 or 40%, there are microscopic metastases, but we don't know who has them. So everyone gets the chemo. We know it helps on average, but if we could figure that out with a biomarker to figure out who has the little spots of cancer and who doesn't, then we could just give the chemo to the 30% that really need it. So the next step for us is really after the common trial is to be able to get these biomarkers developed that lets us give the more personalized care that we want to give. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question, when performing a blood test for these trials, is it painful at all for the patient? So yeah, I can, uh, can take that one. And um, so really we take the blood just from your, a patient's arm. So it would just be like um, just going, you know, to, to life labs and getting a blood test. So a little bit of a pinch and maybe a tiny bit of a bruise afterwards, but otherwise, it's sort of uh, a minimal amount of pain, much less so than a tissue biopsy. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Allen. And this one is along the same lines. How many blood samples are taken for each trial? So for the, the studies that um, Dr. Palma and Dr. Wynn described that we're doing, we take three tubes of blood um, and that all together, that is just about one and a half tablespoons of blood. Um, and you can take them all from the same needle. So again, it doesn't really hurt. We just, the, the, the nurse just pops them on and takes them. So we're able to do all of those different biomarkers just with uh, one and a half tablespoons of blood. Wow, wow, okay, great, thank you. Uh, our fifth question, how much damage is done to the senses when treating brain cancers? Let's bring Dr. Hem back on. So we have a we have a brain surgeon right here. <laughs> You're still needed, Dr. Hem. So that's a great question. And there's actually a follow-up question in the chat too about um, what are the possible side effects of the treatment that you and Dr. Wong were talking about. So maybe Dr. Hem, do you want to do what are how much damage is done to the senses in treating brain cancers? And then Eugene, maybe you could talk about the side effects of the electrodes and everything. Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a terrific question. And part of understanding uh, the uh, potential for this type of strategy is figuring out what are the parameters that work best to treat the cancer and leave the normal brain structure and function alone. And so there are uh, parameters that are currently in use for, for other indications that are meant to capture the activity of the nerve cells and actually drive them. So, so the, the clinician can program the frequency, for example, that they want to drive this new electric field and create uh, a disruption of the normal electric field that's, that's giving the patient problems. So in movement disorders, in pain, this type of thing, uh, 
is a, is a strategy that's been used for decades. But in cancer, it's different. And so in cancer, we don't want to capture the electrical activity of normal cells in the brain. We actually, we want to do the opposite. We want to leave those alone. So we want to figure out what are the parameters that are effective against the cancer cells, but do not drive the normal cells. And so if you can figure those, that separation uh, appropriately, uh, there should not be any damage to senses or other functions, motor function, thinking function. Uh, they should be completely distinct, even though you're creating electric fields in the brain. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hebb. And this one uh, goes along with that, I think, to a degree. But what are the what is the name of the surgery robots and what is the cost? So the surgery robot is called uh, Neuromate and it's made by Renishaw, and it's used primarily in, in our institute for epilepsy surgery. So in, in some of the uh, work that's done for epilepsy patients, multiple electrodes are placed within the brain, in particular to uh, measure and monitor seizure activity. And so the benefit of that type of a, a robot is that the surgeon and clinical team can plan out the precise location where the, the electrodes will be placed and look at important structures like blood vessels and important areas of the brain uh, that can be avoided when implanting these type of electrodes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, this next question is around the biomarkers uh, and it looks like Dr. Palma, our biomarkers are identical for all cancers or do they differ? Yeah, let me get Dr. Bot into this conversation too. We might as well get everybody on uh, the beauty of modern technology. So Dr. Bot, um, <laughs> there you are without your mask, which is good. It's nice to see your whole face, right? Uh, so in common areas, obviously we wear masks and in our offices, we don't. So then we're all in our offices as much as we can be. So Dr. Bot, what do you, can you comment on that? Are biomarkers all the same for all cancers or are they different? Uh, well, it depends. Again, um, for this study, we are using all three markers, but if you look at individual cancers, uh, they don't use all three markers. That makes our study unique. They use one particular biomarker for their study. Um, yeah, but they can use all three markers, but at this uh, moment, they are not using all three. And, and maybe just to give a, a very relatable example, especially as I get older, you know, PSA is like the, one of the oldest biomarkers ever, right? It's just something in the blood that, that, that's the prostate specific antigen, something in the blood that you can measure um, that can show you if you're if you have prostate cancer, if your prostate cancer is getting worse, but it has issues that it can go up for other reasons, like if you have an infection, so it's not perfect. And I think years ago, we were hoping that it'd be very easy to find a PSA type marker for every cancer. But unfortunately, it's only a minority that were easy to find. Then we have to get all the smart scientists in the lab to find the other ones that aren't so easy to find. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everyone. That concludes our, our question and answer portion. And I'd like to turn the floor back to Dr. Palma and Dr. Allen for a few closing remarks. Well, yeah, thank you, everybody, again, for I think, thank all the presenters for um, really amazing uh, presentations. Um, hopefully, you got a really good scope of all the work that we're doing. I think we hit surgery, radiation, um, uh, chemotherapy, the lab, and everything, and it's always exciting, as Dr. Hebb said, to see what each other are doing, because we sometimes get really busy doing our own things, so it's great to see that. Um, but most of all, I really want to thank um, all of the attendees, all the, the donors, all the potential donors, all the community members just interested in the work that we're doing here at LHSC. Um, it would not at all be possible without you. So um, thank you so much. Yeah, I just want to add that, uh, you know, it's nice to have these informal conversations and answer your questions. So hopefully there'll be a time when we can have people come in again in real life and do this. And if you have questions that you're interested in, we didn't get to all of them, just uh, email them to Pam or Shannon or whomever, and they'll pass it on to us and, uh, and we'll get back to you.
So with that, we will pass it back to Pam. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Palma, Dr. Allen, Dr. Wong, Dr. Wynn, Dr. Heb, Dr. Bott. Thank you all so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you for your incredible presentations and for sharing all of the work that you're doing, uh, you know, and helping, trying to help change outcomes for our cancer patients. It really, it really was incredible. Very fascinating, very innovative, and just so amazing that you guys are right here in London, Ontario, first team of its kind in Canada. So thank you all for your time and for sharing. And then to all of you joining us this afternoon, our donors, our partners, our supporters, a huge thank you to all of you. This would not be possible without your generosity and without your support. And we are so grateful for all that you do every day. Donors really do change care and they definitely move the dial. So thank you. And we hope you found the information and the presentations informative and you've learned just how far we've come and where, where we're going and how that will change care. So this concludes our virtual tour, Stopping the Spread of Cancer. On behalf of all of us, once again, thank you for joining us. We wish you a wonderful evening. Take good care, stay safe. Bye-bye.